I'm in the workmen's hall, a monument to the men who worked down Big Pit. It was paid for out of miners' pockets, built with their own bare hands. After it opened in 1895, it became the miners' meeting place and a symbol of their solidarity. Back then, more than 12,000 people lived here. It was a vibrant town with 50 pubs, three schools, a dozen chapels, and as many choirs. Oh, Blenheim was a wonderful place. Well, I suppose I was young and I didn't realize, but it was a, a real fairy place, Blenheim was. And of course, you never went out from you anywhere. But uh, entertainment? Entertainment, plenty. So we yes, yes, excellent. When I was a child, I can remember, there were shops everywhere, you know. And the pubs, well, there's hundreds of them, eh? Basically, Blenheim was a thriving place, it was a happy place. People had money, the pit provided the money. But as the coal industry declined, the heart would be ripped out of Blenheim. Since the beginning of the 20th century, new fuels like oil and natural gas as well as cheap imports from abroad, threatened King Cole's rule. In South Wales, there were hundreds of pit closures. In just a few decades, the number of miners plummeted from a quarter of a million to just 20,000. Then, of course, in the 1980s, came the miners' strike. The titanic struggle between Margaret Thatcher and the head of the National Union of Miners, Arthur Scargill, sounded the final death knell for the industry. Within 10 years, all but one deep mine in South Wales would have stopped production. The catastrophe for Blaine Effen came earlier than most. Big Pit shut less than a year after Thatcher swept to power. The 3rd of February 1980 was the darkest day in Blenarvan's history. Big Pitt's life as a working coal mine was over. This was devastating news to the miners and their families. Blenarvan looked set on a course towards dereliction and decay. We were all devastated because um, we were a close community and um, uh, when, uh, when the pit did uh, decide to shut, uh, the world fell apart, really. At that particular time, there were a lot of people there that hadn't done any other work other than the pit. So they were, they were fearful of where they were going to go. I can liken it to um, a close relative who we've known we've been ill for a long time, finally passing away. You knew it was going to happen, but it still hurts. As 250 miners faced redundancy or relocation, it looked like Big Pit itself would be bulldozed into oblivion. The official policy was to dismantle collieries, reclaim the land and put it to better use, in effect to wipe the slate clean. It was a response triggered by the worst civilian mining accident in living memory, the Aberfan disaster. In October 1966, the coal tip above the town of Aberfan crashed down on the school. 144 people were killed, most of them children. The tragedy sent shockwaves to the South Wales valleys and hardened attitudes towards the mining industry. Aberfan brought an initial realisation that something had to be done, particularly to the tips which posed threats. Whilst they provided a living for whole lifetimes, there were also very bitter memories about the dangers, the hard work, the health damage that was done. I mean, there was great resentment towards the mines, but of course they were pretty unsightly. And, um, People didn't enjoy having that sort of landscape right next to their houses. 
As all traces of the coal industry disappeared, there was an idea that one mine should be saved for posterity. The National Coal Board and the Welsh Tourist Office thought Big Pit was the perfect candidate. Instead of closing Big Pit, we had planned to turn it into a mining museum. What were they thinking of? They'd go to a colliery rather than a stately home or a castle. Coal mines were dirty, dank and dangerous, ugly eyesores. Not exactly a fun day out for all the family. For most people, heritage was about beautiful buildings, like Tintin Abbey or Cardiff Castle. Places where you could find out about the rich and powerful. A recently closed coal mine was neither ancient nor attractive. But while British industry was in decline, curiosity about it was on the rise. There were signs that industrial tourism could work. Ironbridge Museum in Shropshire had paved the way. Exhibits included the world's first cast iron bridge, metal founders and blast furnaces. It was new, it was revolutionary. Um, we had all read about kings and queens and abbeys and monasteries in our history textbooks and here was a new history about um, a period which was largely unknown. But Iron Bridge was one thing. After all, it was credited with being the birthplace of the Industrial Revolution and it was set in a beautiful location. Big Pit was clearly no Iron Bridge. And it would cost a fortune to run. The star attraction was to be a trip underground, but the National Coal Board said that a million pounds a year were needed just to keep the mine safe for the general public. But the seed of the idea, once so, began to grow. A consortium led by the Welsh Tourist Board came up with an ambitious business proposal. They believed the museum could attract a quarter of a million visitors a year and that it would help revive Blynaffan's fortunes. One of the brains behind the scheme was Gareth Gregory, head of projects at the Tourist Board. It was important for this locality that there should be some ray of hope, something positive coming out of the death of an industry. The fact that visitors were being attracted to this area might encourage inward investment. It, there might be some other kinds of spin-offs. At least the name would be kept in the public consciousness. In the end, the project went ahead with nearly a million pounds in grants and the support of the National Coal Board. It was one of the largest investments ever made in industrial heritage. But a mine had never been converted into an underground museum before, so it was an immense gamble for everyone involved. The road to opening day turned out to be a rocky one. Costs of meeting safety standards overran by a third, and the opening was delayed by two years. At last, in 1983, the museum launched a celebrity-endorsed campaign advertising the unique underground tour. But it would take more than that to convince the locals. I couldn't imagine why anyone would want to go down the coal mine unless they were paid to do it. <laughs> Perhaps men would have wanted to go down, but I never thought for one minute that women or children uh, would like to go down there and see what it was like. Oh, a museum, oh, you're right. I think it was a bit of a laugh among the boys, like, you know. Um, and that was it. But for management, it was no laughing matter. The project was already in financial difficulties. Big Pete desperately needed people to pitch up and fork out their £2.50 entry fee from day one. The moment of truth finally arrived on the 31st of March, 1983. The great and the good turned up for a grand opening ceremony. But after the fanfare died down, would the public show up and pay up? Well, I finally understood the meaning of the word trepidation. And I left here, it was snowing, and it was open to the public on the following day, and I was seriously worried about its future. But, 
Over 300 people a day turned up in the first month alone. Most were on pre-booked school trips or bus holidays from abroad. It was an encouraging start. This way then please. Right, put your equipment on. First of all, your helmet. All we do now, we don't go up the table, put a belt around your waist for when we go down. Okay. okay. And this is what they got for their money. Okay, then, if John Scandrick worked in mining for 17 years. He was one of the guides who can talk about the history of the pit and share his experiences of being a miner. It's, very, it's five kilos. And we wore those every single day. Yes, we did. Then he goes under your helmet, creeps on the back. And now we go behind the barrier, please. All right. Do I look like a proper miner? Um, I'll tell you later. <laughs> Tracing the footsteps of the men who worked here. It's a 90 meter descent to pit bottom. If you can all follow me, please. We just go around this way. Now, when this mine was working, in my time you could travel up to two to three miles. And if you can remember, please watch your heads, it is quite long. Going back to Victorian times, families worked. Basically, first of all, the father used to dig the coal out. The boy between the ages of 12 and 15, he would load these we call drums. And then the women took over. Their jobs, pushing them. Tonning weight. As we go along. The tour includes the stables where the pit ponies were once harnessed. It all feels as real as it could be. That place down here, it's, it's dark, it's dank, it's really grimy. I mean, obviously I've not been down a, a mine shaft before, but it feels authentic. It hasn't been prettified or, or made nicer for the tourists. You know, it feels, it feels grim. Above ground, the inner workings of the colliery were on display. People could even take a look in the locker rooms and the pit head baths where the men began and ended their day. And there were live exhibits, including pit ponies and metal workers, who made tools in the old blacksmith's workshop. Against many people's expectations, Big Pit was a hit, with nearly 100,000 visitors by the end of the year. But while it looked set to become a money spinner, none of the cash actually found its way here into the town. People had expected that with the museum opening, it was going to bring more trade into the town and bring more people into the town, and it didn't happen. As soon as they'd been, been up the pit, they'd jump in and they'd drive off and perhaps down to Abergavenny or Ponypool. Have a look around down there because nobody ever came into Blood Island. Big Pit's failure to draw tourists into the town was a bitter blow for Blynethon. And one that got much worse after 1984, the year of the miners' strike. With no alternative employment, Blynethon slipped into a downward spiral. Hundreds of residents left. Unemployment nearly doubled, and many shops and businesses went under. Very depressing, shops closing, people moving away, it, you know, not a lot of jobs in the area. It was, was depressing. The look of the town centre was bad, you know, it was off-putting to a lot of people. I think it stopped a lot of people coming into the town centre. Up at Big Pit, annual visitor numbers hovered around the 100,000 mark. It was a disappointment for the backers, who'd hoped for more than twice that number. Big Pit was turning out to be anything but a gold mine. It struggled on into the 90s against the odds. A disaster was about to strike for a second time. In 1994, British coal was privatised and cut its support. The museum was left with a £300,000 black hole in its finances. It had always been a worry that this pit would turn into a bottomless one as far as finances were concerned. So we really feared, I think, that uh, that would, unless we could find some more permanent solution, uh, that would be finally the end of this experiment. 
Management desperately searched for ways to bring Big Pit back from the brink. At the same time, another madcap idea for Blynaffen was brewing. Historians believe that this area provided a unique snapshot of the Industrial Revolution, that it was so special it should become a UNESCO World Heritage Site, up there with the pyramids, the Great Wall of China, and the Taj Mahal. If opening the mine as a museum had seemed bizarre, proposing the whole area as a World Heritage Site sounded completely insane. They couldn't quite picture it, and I, I, mean, I, will, be, I will be quite honest with you. I, I, I mean, when, they, when it was first mooted for going for World Heritage Site, I thought, well, you must be joking, really. Well, it was, it was a laugh at the time, like, you know, we won a pal with uh, Taj Mahal and all, you know. <laughs> but, uh, you know, I'm looking around here, it's a totally different thing to the Taj Mahal, isn't it? But ideas about what made a World Heritage Site had moved on from simple aesthetics. Places which showed the history of ordinary working people were also being acknowledged for their role in shaping the world as we know it. If you recognise that industrialisation has transformed the world over the last 200 years, it has its roots in this country, it is still going on, only it's in India or Brazil or China, and you trace back the origins of industrialisation, you end up in places like Blanavon. How can you compare Blanavon to the Taj Mahal? There's no comparison, of course, because the Taj Mahal is a monument, a terrific monument, but it's a monument to one person, that great monument of love. Blanavon and its landscape is a monument to the hundreds and thousands of unsung heroes of the Industrial Revolution. When you think of the way that so many towns were changed and altered in the 1970s or the development, etc., Blanavon wasn't, and therefore it retains very much its industrial character. The town hadn't been modernised. The hillsides were still scarred by the evidence left by mining. Big Pit was one of only two deep mines still open in South Wales. And the jewel in the crown was the ironworks, with its cluster of workers' cottages around it. It all made Blynaffen one of the most perfect examples of early industrialisation in the world. But if the World Heritage bid was to succeed, it needed the backing of the local authorities. The council realised that it could attract government grants, which would help revive Blynaffen. We were interested in regeneration, and regeneration across the board, not just physical, but economic and cultural as well. The question was how do you get enough energy, enough investment, enough change, and World Heritage Site uh, status became the sort of iconic doorway through which we saw uh, that we had to pass in order to get the regeneration of the town underway. Blynaffen had tried heritage as tourism before with Big Pit. This time though, the whole town was part of the plan. The council got their bid together and astonishingly, they made it onto a short list of potential British sites. But then Blynaffen was up against already world famous locations like Kew Gardens, Shakespeare's Stratford and the Lake District. Only one of these sites would go through for selection by UNESCO. Remarkably, Blynaffen was chosen and went through to the final round. Now it would be judged alongside nearly 70 other places from around the world. But could Blynaffen really win the ultimate heritage prize? On the 30th of November 2000, the town gathered here in the Workmen's Hall to find out. Everyone was on tenterhooks as they listened to the news transmitted live from Australia. That is what it 
it was really exciting and uh, uh, I think everybody felt very hopeful and we're proud really that it's happened to Blenavon and that uh, Blenavon have been recognised internationally. You know, we now we're a World Heritage Town. Oh, we were excited to think that it was coming to Blenavon. Yeah. It was a really an honour, wasn't it? Mm, yes, you know. there was money coming that, yeah. was there, mm. that they could spend on the town, yeah. wasn't there? Hard on the heels of World Heritage status came more good news. Big Pit was to become the National Mining Museum of Wales. The story of Big Pit had been a roller coaster ride, from bus to boom and back again and again. But now at last its struggle for survival seemed to be over. With its new title came a massive five and a quarter million pound grant from the Heritage Lottery Fund. The money went on restoring buildings, a new mining exhibition, and an extension of the underground tour. In 2001, the admission fee was scrapped. The result was that visitor numbers nearly doubled. But without ticket sales, Big Pit needs a government subsidy of over one and a half million pounds a year to keep going. Handouts have also helped Lynathan. The World Heritage brand really has been milked for all it's worth. The council has attracted over 30 million pounds of grants, which has been spent on giving the town a complete facelift. I think it's brought it out of the doldrums, you know. People in Blenheim are very proud of what has been achieved. When you, when you have to look around Blenheim since 2000, there have been incredible improvements. Well, it's, it's a lot better now, now that they have done it up. You know, it's 100% better. It looks tidy. But so far, the World Heritage status hasn't delivered on all its promises. Less than 150 people are directly employed full-time in tourism. Parts of the town don't look good. And worse still, local services have been cut. The jury is still out on whether World Heritage status has really made a difference. In the long term, the people were very happy to see all this renovation work going on. But now, now that the work is coming to completion, I think there's a lot of bad feeling in the town because facilities that the townspeople can use, not the tourists, have now been taken away from us. The trick of, of getting visitors into the town centre hasn't quite come right, you know, that's going to be worked on and uh, I think that's the last piece in the jigsaw now. The youngsters today, uh, they all start and they go for them because nothing left you for them. And it's a bit of a, a worry, really, uh, to see it in the state it is. Although we've got a, we've got a healthy status, uh, we don't seem to be uh, getting out of it. Those dreams of regenerating the old industrial town through a cocktail of museums and heritage still haven't quite come true. It's great that Blymathen's history has been saved, but the town and the museum rely on handouts, which make them vulnerable in these credit crunch times. It's clear that heritage and tourism are only part of the answer to Blymathen's problems. For a free open university booklet exploring some of the key debates, call 0845 366 8011 or visit bbc.co.uk forward slash saving Britain's past and tell us what you would save as your heritage.